time, November the 18th, from BradfordSoulSpace.org. He's talking Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, the rich get richer, and Matthew 25, through the eyes of the poor. Remember, not many people have been able to crack Jesus' code in the parables. Most get fooled by the parables. So, church was a real eye-opener yesterday. I retold the story of the talents from the perspective of the man who buried his gold talent, the slothful servant. I challenged conservative and liberal understandings of the story in Matthew 25, verse 14, by pointing out that God is not a cold-hearted, absentee landlord. Jesus certainly wouldn't have supported usury or trade that would have made the rich richer and the poor poorer. Well, that's what I say in my Bible poem. Jesus was against reverse Robin Hood, taken from the poor who are hungry to give to the rich who can't eat. The hero of the story, when read from the perspective of the poor, is the slave who refuses to take part in the system. It was hard for some in the congregation, but for others, eyes were opened. I cannot, of course, be sure that I have the interpretation right. You do. I'll bet on it. But it is great to see 30-odd young people really wrestling with Scripture and considering the radical teachings perhaps truer to the original meanings. Here is the story I told. My name's Jeremiah and I'm terrified. I'm about to lose my job, my status, everything. I don't know how I'm going to tell my family and my two small children. But I have my principles and my faith and I must stick to them. My boss is a hard man. He owns lots of property south of Tyre. But he does not stay here often. He prefers to live the high life in Rome, partying and sucking up to those who gave him the land in the first place. Before he left the last time, he gave me and two other slaves a task. He wanted us to make even more money for him. His greed is insatiable. He gave his favorite, Herod, five talents of gold. He went and bought the cornfields from the poor farmers in the region. When he had virtually all in the market, he forced the price of bread up and he made a killing. Rufus used his two gold bars to buy up some property on the coast and began to charge extortionate rents. He soon made two more gold talents worth. This world seems so wrong. Those with more seem to get richer while the poor suffer. What little they have is taken away by the rich with taxes and debt. Debt service. I felt uncomfortable with all this, so I buried the damn talent of gold in the ground. My wife pleaded with me to put it in the bank so I would at least gain the interest for my master. But I told her, usury is a sin for us Jews. Moses set up these laws to protect us from money-making banks, and I will not go against my faith. But now I hear that my master returns and he will want a reckoning. This is a man who takes what is not his, who reaps what he has not sown. He kills his enemies. In the parable of the Minas, slay him in front of me if he didn't pay my interest. And in the old days, Jesus' day, if you didn't pay your death gamble, they could work you to death. Either two years on a boat or six months in a gold mine. But you were worked to death. Just go read David Assel's Babylonian Woe. But even though I'm afraid of him, my faith is strong. I will stand up to him, whatever the cost. So below is a well-thought-out sermon on the subject by Just Space friend Simon Barrow of Ecclesia. Take Jesus' so-called parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14, 30. We ought to deal with the parable of Minas, too, because at the end of it, the master thumps the servant out, but instead of throwing him out into the alley where men weep and gnash or teeth, he says, slay him in front of me. The death in the death gamble was more obvious in the parable of the Minas. According to some interpreters, its message is obvious. God rewards the smart and diligent and punishes the feckless and hopeless. By implication, say prosperity gospelers in the USA, Africa, and near to home, if you are successful, it's because God has blessed you. And if you are not, it is because you are faithless. What could be simpler and more wrong? Here's a human standard of judgment assuming and usurping the divine. The assumption we make is that the master in the parable is God who wants people to go out and double their money. But as biblical scholar Walter Wink suggests, this goes against the social conventions of the time, against the prohibition on usury, against the narrative drift of Matthew chapter 25, 
and against the clear message of Gospels concerning the kind of merciful God who was disclosed in and by Jesus. Like the famous story of the wily steward who cheats an unjust economic system in order to save the skins of his servants and earn their loyalty in tough times, Luke 16, 1, 9, the parable of talents is actually subversive of our conventional assumptions about how right and good asserts itself in a wicked world. Remember, it's a parable because most people who read it get the message wrong, completely backwards. Wink points out that in the first century, Jewish culture, headlong individual pursuit of riches, especially at the expense of other members of the community, was looked on as a breach of communal and religious loyalty. Families fell into debt and poverty because of the usurious interest rates charged the well by the wealthy. Jesus' listeners, who would have suffered such indignities, would have known all too well that the only way for the characters in the story to build their asset base that quickly would be through fraud, money lending at exorbitant rates, or sidebar expropriation through tax collecting, skimming off an additional levy. For the villain to represent God wouldn't have made any sense to them at all. In the story, the first two servants do as they're told, but the third is effectively a conscientious objector. By refusing to participate in the ripping off of his fellow servants, and refusing to deposit the money so the bank could do it for him, he indicts an unjust economic order that causes poverty and misery. But when you stand up in this way, the parable says, you often end up an outcast or a corpse. While people willing to cheat the vulnerable to get all the rewards do get all the rewards. This is an inbuilt asymmetry to the way the money system works when Mammon, who is the real master in this parable, rules. Someone cracked the parable too. I cracked it 25 years ago. This is a sermon given on November 16, 2008 at St. Stephen's Church in the central parish of Exeter. So my comment to Matthew 25, verse 14, the rich get richer from King of the Paupers, November 19th, where I wrote to the guy who's losing his job, welcome to the ranks of the paupers. The only good thing is that there's even more of us and less of them. You are absolutely right that Christ's brilliant parable was intended to fool the readers into thinking it was an approbation of interest on the master's money. I've had a judge tell me that my contention, Christ was showing us how to stiff the banks and on an unreasonable debt that has grown beyond the capacity to repay, was wrong. That since the master was Jesus, you should have put my money with the bankers and brought me what was mine with interest before he stated Christ's incredible differential equation for debt growth. To him who has abundance will more be given. From him who has no abundance, even he has him taken away. Reverse Robin Hood. That's how interest works, just as demand. There's more. So I told him, go check out my King of the Paupers, How Christ Fought Banks, the Parable of the Talents and the Minas, the Christ on Usury, Old Testament Usury, Christ's Golden Mules. To save yourself, you're going to have to form a local employment trading system, time trading barter network, or get your company to pay you in small denomination company bonds that can be redeemed for company product. And you'll accept any other registered company's bonds too. And bonds must be linked to a time standard of money. Fortunately, it's easy and it saved the Argentinians before it saved their country. I've done my Christian duty. I've engineered the left software and got it in the Millennium Declaration at the UN. The Unilex Resolution C6 to get your time valued as collateral for an interest-free loan just like gold. I've told about the blueprint of the economic lifeboat you must build to save yourself until it's so large it's no longer a mere lifeboat. But once you're creditworthy again, don't jump back to using government authorized bank money like they did back in Argentina. It's to stay stable forever. Look, the highest child mortality rate in El Paso, in El Paso Texas, near Mexico, went down when nuns installed a time trading database where every new mama and baby in the barrio could hire from a list of experienced mothers to show them how to take care of their babies in exchange for an IOU for the time in time dollars. Young mama and baby will care for older mama later. It works, and it spread to lots of the third world, mainly Latin America. Oh, right. 
Our media has not explained how Argentina went from a busted 1 over S minus I banking system in 2001, and Argentina pays off their massive debt two years later after using a 1 over S system. I'm the only internet writer who predicted the Argentinian resurgence when I found their provinces were going to issue small denomination bonds. Maybe corporations, too, backed up my product. And I was right. And I reported how they did it. No one else has reported that story. Success story. Isaiah 24 verse 2 warns of a shifting sand when loan sharkings allowed officially to stock the land. And it shall be as with the people, with the priest, no joke. As with the servant, so with the master, none escape the yoke. And as with the maiden, as so with her mistress, enmity at stake. As with buyer, so with seller, all must suffer rake. As with the lender, with the borrower, it shall be. As with taker and the giver of the usury. The land shall utterly be emptied, spoiled while decadent. Beloved fools, they have transgressed his law on money's rent. So therefore hath the curse devoured earth, not heavenly, and desolate are they who dwell in hell with usury.